from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Plunge to the Dead by C. Barry Quinn The autumn dusk had stained the sky with shadows and orange oblongs, traced the windows in my neighbor's homes, as Jules de Gradin and I sat sipping Kaisermar and coffee in the study after dinner. Mon Dieu, the little Frenchman sighed. I have the mal du pays, my friend. The little children run and play along the roadways at St. Cloud, and on the Ile de France, the pastry cook sets up their booths. Cour bleu, it takes the strength of character not to stop and buy those cakes of so much taste and fancy. The Napoleons, they are crisp and fragile as a coquette's promise. The eclairs filled with cool sweet cream, the cream puffs, all aglow with cherries. Just to see them is to love life better. They, the shrilling of the doorbell startled me. The pressure on the button must have been that of one who leant against it. Dr. Talbridge, I must see him right away, a woman's voice demanded as Norma McGuinness, my household factum, grudgingly responded to the hall. The doctor's office is over, ma'am, Nora answered frigidly. Half past nine to eleven in the morning and two f to four in the afternoon is when he sees his patients. If it's an urgent case, you have there lots of good young doctors in the neighborhoods. But Dr. Talbridge, is he here? The visitor demanded sharply. He is, and he's after digesting his dinner. An elegant dinner it was, though I do say so it shouldn't, and he can't be disturbed. He'll see me all right. Tell him it's Nella Bentley, and I've got to talk to him. The Grandin raised an eyebrow elegantly. The fish at the aquarium have greater privacy than we, my friend, he murmured, but broke off as a visitor came clacking down the hall in high French heels and rushed into the study half a dozen paces in advance of my thoroughly disapproving and more than semi-scandalized Nora. Dr. Talbridge, won't you help me? cried the girl as she fairly leaped across the study and flung her arms about my shoulders. I can't tell dad or mother. They wouldn't understand. So you're the only one. Oh, excuse me. I thought you were alone. Her face went crimson as she saw the Grandin standing by the fire. It's quite all right, my dear, I soothed, freeing myself from her almost hysterical clutch. This is Dr. de Grandin, with whom I've been associated many times. I'd be glad to have the benefit of his advice, if you don't mind. She gave him her hand and a wan smile as I performed the introduction, but her eyes warmed quickly as he raised her fingers to his lips with a soft, enchanté mademoiselle. Women, animals, and children took instinctively to Jules de Grandin. Nella dropped her coat of silky shaven lamb and sank down on the study couch. Her slim young figure molded in her knitted dress of coral rayon as revealingly as though she had been cased in plastic cellulose. She had long violet eyes and a long mouth, smooth, dark hair parted in the middle, a small straight nose, and a small pointed chin. Every line of her is long, but definitely feminine. Breast and hips and throat and legs all delicately curved, without a hint of angularity. I've come to see you about Ned, she volunteered as the grandan lit her cigarette and she sent a nervous smoke stream gushing from between red, trembling lips. He, he's trying to run out on me. 
You mean Ned Minton? I asked, wondering what a middle-aged physician could possibly prescribe for wandering Romeos. I certainly do mean Ned Minton, she replied. And I mean business, too. The darn romantic fool. The grandan's slender brows arched upward till they nearly met the beige blonde hair that slanted sleepy but backwards from his forehead. Pardonne-moi, he murmured. Did I understand correctly, mademoiselle? Your amoureux, how do you say him, sweetheart? Has shown a disposition toward unfaithfulness, yet you accuse him of romanticism? He's not unfaithful. That's the worst of it. He's faithful as Tristan and the Chevalier Bayard, lumped together, sans pour et sans reproche, you know. Says we can't get married, cause... Just a moment, dear, I interrupted, as I felt my indignation mounting. Do you mean the miserable young puppy cheated? and now wants to welch? Her blue eyes widen, and then the little laughter wrinkles formed around them. You dear old mid-Victorian, she broke in. No, he ain't done wrong by our Nell, and I'm not asking you to take your shotgun down and force him to make me an honest woman. Suppose we start at the beginning, then we'll get things straight. You assisted at both our debut. I've been told you've known Ned and me since we were a second old apiece, haven't you? I nodded. No, we've always been crazy about each other, too. In grammar school, high school, and college, don't you? Yes, I agreed. All right. We've been engaged ever since our freshman year at Beaver. Ned just had his frat pin long enough to pin it on my shoulder strap at the first freshman dance. Everything was set for us to stand up in the chancel and say, I do this June. Then Ned's company sent him to New Orleans last December, she paused, drew deeply at her cigarette, crushed its fire out in the ashtray, and set a fresh one glowing. That started it. While he was down there, it seemed that he got playful, mixed up with some glamorous Creole gal. Once more she lapsed into silence, and I could see the heartbreak showing through the armor of her flippant manner. You mean he fell in love? I certainly do not. If he had, I'd have handed back his ring and said, bless you, me children, even if I had to bite my heart in two to do it. But this is no case of a new love crowding out the old. Ned still loves me, never stopped loving me. That's what makes it all seem crazy as a hashish eater's dream. He was in the loose in New Orleans, doing the town with a crowd of local boys and probably had too many ramo fizzies. Then he barged into this Creole dame's place and... She broke off with a gallant effort at a smile. I guess young fellows aren't so different nowadays than they were when you were growing up, sir. Only today we don't believe in sprinkling perfume in the family cesspool. Ned cheated. That's the bald truth of it. He didn't stop loving me. And he hasn't stopped now. But I wasn't there, and that other girl was. There were no conventions to be recognized. Now he's fairly melting with remorse. Says he's not worthy of me, and wants to break off our engagement. Ah, oh, he spends a lifetime doing penance for a moment's folly. But good heavens, I expostulated. If you're willing to forgive, you're telling me, she answered bitterly. We've been over it a hundred times. This isn't 1892. Even nice girl know the facts of life today. And while I'm no more anxious than the next one to put through a deal in shop-worn goods, I still love Ned. And I don't intend to let a single indiscretion rob us of our happiness. I... The hard exterior veneer of modernism melted from her like an autumn ice glaze melting in the warm October sun and the tears coursed down her cheeks, cutting little valleys in her carefully applied makeup. He's my man, doctor, she sobbed bitterly. I've loved them since we made mud pies together. I'm hungry, thirsty for him. He's everything to me, and if he follows out this full renunciation he seems set on, it'll kill me. The grand dame tweaked 
a wax mustache then thoughtfully. You exemplify the practicality of woman, mademoiselle. I applaud your sound, hard common sense, he told her. Bring this silly young romantic foolish one to me. I will tell him. But he won't come, I interrupted. I know these hard-minded young asses. When a lad is set on being stubborn, will you go to work on him if I can get him here, interjected Nella, of a certitude, mademoiselle. You won't think me forward or unmaidenly? This is a medical consultation, mademoiselle. All right. Be in the office this time tomorrow night. I'll have my wandering boyfriend here if I have to bring him in an ambulance. Her performance matched her promise almost too closely for our comfort. We had just finished dinner next night when the frenzied shriek of tortured brakes followed by a crash and the tinkling splatter of smashed glass sounded in the street before the house and in a moment feet dragged heavily across the porch. We were at the door before the bell could buzz and in the disk of brightness sent down by the porch light saw Nella bent half double stumbling forward with a man's arm draped across her shoulders. His feet scuffed blindly on the boards, as though they had forgot the trick of walking, or if all strength had left his knees. His head hung forward, lolling drunkenly, a spate of blood ran down his face and smeared his collar. Good Lord, I gasped, what? Get him into surgery, quick, the girl commanded in a whisper. I'm afraid I rather overdid it. Examination showed the cut across Ned's forehead was more bloody than extensive, while the scalp wound, which plowed backward from his hairline, needed but a few quick stitches. Nella whispered to us as we worked. I got him to go riding with me in my runabout. Just as we got here, I let out a scream and swung the wheel hard over to the right. I was braced for it, but Ned was unprepared and went right through the windshield when I ran the car into the curb. Lord, I thought I'd killed him when I saw the blood. You do think he'll come through all right, don't you, doctor? No thanks to you if he does, you little ninny, I retorted angrily. You might have cut his jugular with your confounded foolishness if... Shh! He's coming out of it, she warned. Start talking to him like a Dutch uncle. I'll be waiting in the study if you want me. And with that tattoo of high heels, she left us with our patient. Nella? Is she all right? Ned cried as he half roused from the surgery table. We had an accident. But certainly, Monsieur, to Grandin soothed. You were driving past our house when a child ran out before your car. Mademoiselle was forced to swerve aside to keep from hitting it. You were cut about the face, but she escaped all injury. Here, he raised a glass of brandy to the patient's lips. Drink this. Ah, so, this is better, n'est-ce pas? For a moment he regarded Ned in silence, then abruptly. You are distraught, Monsieur. When we brought you in, we were forced to give you a small whiff of ether while we patched your cuts. And in your delirium you said... The color which had come into Ned's cheeks as a fiery cognac warmed his veins, drained out again, leaving him as ghastly as a corpse. Did Nella hear me? he asked hoarsely. Did I blab? Compose yourself, Monsieur de Grandin bade. She heard nothing. But it would be well if we heard more. I think I understand your difficulty. I'm a physician and a Frenchman, and no prude. This renunciation, which you make, is but the noble gesture. You've been unfortunate, and now you fear? Have courage. No infection is so bad there is no remedy. Ned's laugh was hard and brittle as the tinkle of a breaking loss. I only wish it were the thing you think, he interrupted. He interrupted. I'd have you give me Salvarsan and see what happened. But there isn't any treatment I can take for this. I'm not delirious and I'm not crazy, gentlemen. I know just what I'm saying. Insane as it may sound, I'm pledged to the dead and there isn't any way to bail me out. Huh? What is it you say? De Grandin's small blue eyes were gleaming with the light of battle as he caught the occult implication in Ned's declaration. Pledged to the dead? 
Comme cela. Ned raised himself unsteadily and balanced on the table edge. It happened in New Orleans last winter, he answered. I finished up my business and was on the loose and thought I'd walk alone through the vieux car, the old French quarter. I'd had dinner at Antoine's and stopped around at the old absinthe house for a few drinks, then strolled down to the French market for a cup of chicory coffee and some doughnuts. Finally, I walked down Royal Street to look at Madame La Laurie's old mansion. That's the famous haunted house, you know. I wanted to see if I could find a ghost. Good Lord, I wanted to. The moon was full that night, but the house was still as old St. Dennis' cemetery. So after peering through the iron grills that shut the courtyard from the street for half an hour or so, I started back toward Canal Street. I'd almost reached Bienville Street when just as I passed one of those funny two-storied iron-grilled balconies so many of the old houses have, I heard something drop on the sidewalk at my feet. It was a japonica, one of those rose-like flowers they grow in the courtyard gardens down there. When I looked up, a girl was laughing at me from the second story of the balcony. Mon fleuron, monsieur, s'il vous plaît, she called, stretching down on a white arm for the bloom. The moonlight hung about her like a veil of silver tissue, and I could see her plainly as though it had been noon. Most New Orleans girls are dark. She was fair. Her hair was very fine and silky, and about the color of a frosted chestnut burr. She wore it in a long bob with curls around her face and neck, and I knew without being told that those ringlets weren't put in with a hot iron. Her face was pale, colorless, and fine-textured as a magnolia petal, but her lips were brilliant crimson. There was something reminiscent of those ladies you see pictured in directoire prints about her. Small, regular features, straight, white, high-waisted gown tied with a wide girdle underneath her bosom, low, round-cut neck, and tiny ball-puff sleeves that left her lovely arms uncovered to the shoulder. She was like Rose Beauharnais or Madame de Fontenay, except for her fair hair and her eyes. Her eyes were like an eastern slave's, languishing and passionate, even when she laughed, and she was laughing then, with a throaty, almost caressing laugh, as I tossed the flower up to her, and she leant across the iron railing, snatching at a futile as it fell just short of reach. Cessanne's profit, she laughed at last. Your skill is too small, or my arm too short, monsieur. Bring it up to me. You mean for me to come up there, I asked? But certainly. I have teeth, but will not bite you. Maybe. The street door to the house was open. I pushed it back, groped my way along a narrow hall, and climbed a flight of winding stairs. She was waiting for me on the balcony, lovelier, close up, if that were possible, than when I'd seen her from the sidewalk. Her gown was china silk, so sheer and clinging that the shadow of her charming figure showed against its rippling folds like a lovely silhouette. The sash which bound it was six foot length of rainbow ribbon, tied coquettishly beneath her shoulders and trailing in fringed ends almost to her dress hem at the back. Her feet were stockingless and shod with sandals fastened with cross straps of purple grass cane laced about the ankles. Save for the small gold rings that scintillated in her ears, she wore no ornaments of any kind. Mon frère, monsieur, she ordered haughtily, stretching out her hand. Then her eyes lighted with a sudden laughter, and she turned her back to me, bending her head forward. But no, it fell into your hands. It is that you must put it in its place again, she ordered, pointing to a curl where she wished a flower set. Come, monsieur, I wait upon you. On the settee by the wall, a guitar lay. She picked it up and ran her slim pale fingers twice across the strings, sounding a soft, melancholy chord. When she began to sing, 
Her words were slurred and languorous and had trouble understanding them, for the song was ancient when Bienville turned the first spadeful of earth that marked the ramparts of New Orleans. O knights of gay Toulouse and sweet Bausaire, greet me my own true love and speak him fair. Her voice had the throaty, velvety quality one hears in people of the southern countries, and the words of the song seemed fairly to yearn with the sadness and passionate longing of the love bereft. But she smiled as she put by her instrument a curious smile, which heightened the mystery of her face and her eyes, seemed suddenly half questing, half drowsy as she asked. Would you ride off upon your grim, pale horse and leave poor little Julie Diane famishing for love, Monsieur? Ride off from you? I answered gallantly. How can you ask? A verse from Burns came to me. Then fare thee well, my bonny lass, and fare thee well a while, and I will come to thee again, and it were ten thousand mile. There was something avid in the look she gave me, Something more than gratified vanity shone in her eyes as she turned her face up to me in the moonlight. You mean it? She demanded in a quivering, breathless voice. Of course, I bantered. How could you doubt it? Then swear it. Seal the oath with blood. Her eyes were almost closed and her lips were lightly parted as she leant toward me. I could see the thin white line of tiny, gleaming teeth behind lush red of her lips. The lip of a pink tongue swept across her mouth, leaving it warmer, moister, redder than before. In her throat a small pulse throbbed palpitatingly. Her lips were smooth and soft as the flower petals in her hair, but as they crushed on mine they seemed to creep about them as though endowed with a volition of their own. I could feel them gliding almost stealthily, searching greedily it seemed, until they covered my entire mouth. Then came a sudden searing pain, which passed as quickly as it flashed across my lips, and she seemed inhaling deeply, desperately, as though to pump the last faint gasp of breath up from my lungs. A humming sounded in my ears. Everything went dark around me, as if I had been plunged in some abysmal flood. A spell of dreamy lassitude was stealing over me when she pushed me from her so abruptly that I staggered back against the iron railing of the gallery. I gasped and fought for breath like a winded swimmer coming from the water, but the half-captured breath seemed suddenly to catch itself unbidden in my throat, and a tingling chill went rippling up my spine. The girl had dropped down to her knees, staring at the door which led into the house, and as I looked I saw a shadow writh across the little pool of moonlight which lay upon the sill. Three feet or so in length it was, thick through as a man's wrist, the faint light shining dully on its scaly armor and disclosing the fork lightning of its darling tongue. It was a cotton mouth, a water moccasin, deadly as a rattlesnake but more dangerous, for it sounds no warning before striking, and can strike when only half coiled. How it came there on the second story gallery of a house so far from any swamp lump, I had no means of knowing, but there it lay bent in the design of a double S, its wedge-shaped head swaying an upreared neck a scant six inches from the girl's soft bosom, its forked tongue darting deathly menace. Half paralyzed with fear and loathing, I stood there in a perfect ecstasy of horror, not daring to move hand or foot lest I aggravate the reptile into striking. But my terror changed to stark amazement as my senses slowly registered the scene. The girl was talking to the snake and it listened as a person might have done. No, no, grand tante, halt la, she replied. C'est et à moi, il est dévoué. The serpent seemed to pause uncertainly, grudgingly, as though but half convinced 
then shook its head from side to side, much as an aged person might when only half persuaded by a youngster's argument. Finally, silently as a shadow, it slid back again into the darkness of the house. Julie bounded to her feet and put her hands upon my shoulders. You must go, my friend, she whispered fiercely, quickly. Here she comes again. It was not easy to convince her. She is old and very doubting. Oh, I am afraid, afraid. She hid her face against my arm, and I could feel the throbbing of her head against me. Her hands stole up towards my cheek and pressed them between palms as cold as a graveyard clay, as she whispered. Look at me, mon beau. Her eyes were closed. Her lips were slightly parted, and beneath the arc of her long lashes, I could see the glimmer of fast-forming tears. Embrace, moi, she commanded in a trembling breath. Kiss me, and go quickly. But, oh, mon cher, do not forget poor little foolish Julia Dayenne, who has put her trust in you. Come to me again tomorrow night. I was reeling as from vertigo as I walked back to the Greenwald, and the bartender looked at me suspiciously when I ordered a Sazerac. They have a strict will against serving drunken men at that hotel. The liquor stung my lips like liquid flames, and I put the cocktail down half finished. When I set the fan to going and switched the light on in my room, I looked into the mirror and saw two little beads of flesh, bright blood upon my lips. Good Lord, I murmured, stupid as I brushed the blood away. She bit me. It all seemed so incredible that if I had not seen the blood upon my mouth, I'd have thought I suffered from some lunatic hallucination or one too many fraps at the absinthe house. Julie was as quaint and out of time as a directoire print, even in a city where time stands still as it does in old New Orleans. Her costume, her half-shy boldness, her... This was simply madness, nothing less. Her conversation with that snake. What was it she had said? My French was none too good, and in the circumstances it was hardly possible to pay attention to her words. But if I'd understood her, she declared, He's mine. He has dedicated himself to me. And she addressed that crawling horror as Grand Tant, Great Aunt. Feller, you're as crazy as a cockroach, I admonished my reflection in the mirror. But I know what'll cure you. You're taking the first train north tomorrow morning, and if I ever catch you in the view car again, I'll... A sibilating hiss, no louder than the noise made by steam escaping from a kettle spout, sounded close beside my foot. There on the rug, coiled in readiness to strike, was a three-foot cotton mouth, head swaying viciously from side to side. Wicked eyes shining in the bright light from the chandelier. I saw the muscles in the creature's foreparts swell, and in a sort of horror trance I watched its head dart forward, but miraculously it stopped its stroke halfway and drew its head back, turning to glance menacingly at me first from one eye then the other. Somehow it seemed to me the thing was playing with me as a cat might play a mouse, threatening, intimidating letting me know it was master of the situation and could kill me any time it wished, but deliberately refraining from the death stroke. With one leap, I was in the middle of my bed, and when a squad of bellboys came running in response to the frantic call for help, I telephoned. They found me crouched against the headboard, almost wild with fear. They turned the room completely inside out, rolling back the rugs, probing into chairs and sofa, emptying the bureau drawers, even taking down the towels from the bathroom rack. But nowhere was there any sign of the water moccasin that had terrified me. At the end of fifteen minutes search they accepted half a dollar each and went grinning from the room. I knew it would be useless to appeal for help again, for I heard one whisper to another as they paused outside my door. It ain't right to let them Yankees loose in New Orleans. They don't know how to hold their liquor. I didn't take a train next morning. A somehow, I had an idea, crazy as it seemed, that my promise to myself and the sudden inexplicable appearance of the snake beside my foot were related in some way. Just after luncheon, I thought, 
I put the theory to a test. Well, I said aloud, I guess I might as well start packing. Don't want to let the sun go down and find me here. My theory was right. I hadn't finished speaking when I heard the warning hiss, and there poised ready for the stroke the snake was coiled before the door. And it was no phantom either, no figment of an overwrought imagination. It lay upon a rug the hotel management had placed before the door to take the wear of constant passage from the carpet, and I could see the high pile of the rug crushed down beneath its weight. It was flesh and scales and fangs, and it coiled and threatened me in my twelfth floor room in the bright sunlight of the afternoon. Little chills of terror chased each other up my back, and I could feel the short hairs on my neck grow stiff and scratch against my collar, but I kept myself in hand. Pretending to ignore the loathsome thing, I flung myself upon the bed. Oh well, I said aloud. There really isn't any need of hurrying. I promised Julie that I'd come to her tonight, and I mustn't disappoint her. Half a minute later I roused myself upon my elbow and glanced toward the door. The snake was gone. Here's a letter for you, Mr. Minton, said the desk clerk, as I paused to leave my key. The note was on gray paper edged with silver gilt and very highly scented. The penmanship was tiny, stilted, and ill-formed as though the author were used to writing, but I could make it out. Adore, meet me in St. Dent's Cemetery at sunset. Avoue de care pour les denis. Julie. I stuffed the note back in my pocket. The more I thought about the whole affair, the less I liked it. The flirtation had begun harmlessly enough, and Julie was as lovely and appealing as a figure in a fairy tale. But there are unpleasant aspects to most fairy tales, and this was no exception. That scene last night, when she had seemed to argue with a full-grown cotton mouth, the mysterious appearance of the snake whenever I spoke of breaking my promise to go back to her, there was something too much like black magic in it. Now she addressed me as her adored and signed herself for eternity, finally named a graveyard as our rendezvous. Things had become a little bit too thick. I was standing at the corner of Canal and Baron Street, and crowds of office workers and late shoppers elbowed past me. I'll be damned if I'll meet her in a cemetery or anywhere else, I muttered. I've had enough of all this nonsense. A woman's shrill scream, echoed by a man's hoarse shout of terror, interrupted me. On the marble pavement of Canal Street, with half a thousand people bustling by, lay coiled a three-foot water moccasin. Here was proof. I'd seen it twice in my room at the hotel, but I'd been alone each time. Some form of weird hypnosis might have made me think I saw it, but the screaming woman and the shouting man, these panic-stricken people in Canal Street, couldn't all be victims of a spell which had been cast on me. All right, I'll go, I almost shouted, and instantly, as though it had been but a puff of smoke, the snake was gone. The half-fainting woman and a crowd of curious bystanders asking what was wrong left to prove I had not been the victim of some strange delusion. Old St. Denis Cemetery lay drowsing in the blue faint twilight. It has no graves as we know them, for when the city was laid out it was below sea level and bodies were stored away in crypts that row on row like lines of pigeonholes and walls as thick as those of medieval castles. Grass-grown aisles run between the rows of vaults, and the effect is a true city of the dead, with narrow streets shut in by close-set houses. The rattle of a trolley car in Rampart Street came to me faintly as I walked between the rows of tombs. From the river came the mellow-throated bellow of a steamer's whistle, but both sounds were muted as though heard from a great distance. The tomb-lined bastions of St. Denis hold the present out as firmly as they hold the memories of the past within. Down one aisle and up another I walked, the close clipped turf deadening my footfall so I might have been a ghost come back to haunt the ancient burial ground. But nowhere was there sign or trace of Julie. I made the circuit of the labyrinth and finally paused before one of the more pretentious tombs. Looks as if she'd stood me up, I murmured. If she has, 
I have a good excuse to... But no, mon coeur, I have not disappointed you, a soft voice whispered in my ear. See, I am here. I think I must have jumped at the sound of her greeting, for she clapped her hands delightedly before she put them on my shoulders and turned her face up for a kiss. Silly when she chided. Did you think your Judy was unfaithful? I put her hands away as gently as I could, for her utter self-surrender was embarrassing. Where were you? I asked, striving to make neutral conversation. I've been prowling round this graveyard for the last half hour and came through this aisle not a minute ago, but I didn't see you. Oh, but I saw you, Cherie. I have watched you as you made your solemn rounds like a watchman of the night. But it was hard to wait until the sun went down to greet you, mon petit. She laughed again, and her mirth was mellowly musical as a gurgle of cool water poured from a silver vase. How could you have seen me? I demanded. Where were you all this time? But here, of course, she answered naively, resting one hand against the gray stone slab that sealed the tomb. I shook my head bewilderedly. The tomb, like all the others in the deeply recessed wall, was of rough cement encrusted with small seashells, and its sides were straight and blunt without a spear of ivy clinging to them. A sparrow could not have found cover there, yet. Julie raised herself on tiptoe and stretched her arms out right and left, while she looked at me through half-closed, smiling eyes. Je suis un cordier. I am stiff with sleep, she told me, stifling a yawn. But now that you are come, mon cher, I am wakeful as the pussycat that rouses at the scampering of the mouse. Come, let us walk in this garden of mine. She linked her arm through mine and started down the grassy, grave-lined path. Tiny shivers, not of cold, were flickering through my cheeks and down my neck, beneath my ears. I had to have an explanation. The snake, her declaration that she watched me as I searched the cemetery, and from a tomb where a beetle could not have found the hiding place, her announcement she was still stiff from sleeping, now her reference to a half-forgotten graveyard as her garden, See here, I want to know. I started out, but she laid her hand across my lips. Do not ask to know too soon, mon coeur, she bade. Look at me. Am I not veritably elegant? She stood back a step, gathered up her skirts, and swept me a deep curtsy. There was no denying she was beautiful. Her tightly curling hair had been combed high and tied back with a fillet of bright violet tissue which bound her brows like a diadem, and at the front of which in a gray plume was set. In her ears were hung two beautifully matched cameos, outlined in gold and seed pearls, and almost large as silver dollars, a necklace of antique dull gold hung around her throat, and its pendant was a duplicate of her ear cameos, while a bracelet of matte gold set with a fourth matched anaglyph was clasped about her left arm just above the elbow. Her gown was sheer white muslin, low cut at front and back, with little puff sleeves at the shoulders, fitted tightly at the bodice and flying sharply from a high set waist. Over it she wore a narrow scarf of violet silk, hung behind her neck and dropping down on either side in front like a clergyman's stole. Her sandals were gilt leather, heelless as a ballet dancer's shoes and laced with violet ribbons. Her lovely, pearl-white hands were bare rings, but on the second toe of her right foot there showed a little cameo which matched the others which she wore. I could feel my heart begin to pound and my breath came quicker as I looked at her, but you look as if you're going to a masquerade, I said. A look of hurt, surprise showed in her eyes. A masquerade, she echoed. But no, it is my best, my very finest that I wear for you tonight, Monador. Do not you like it? Do you not love me, Edward? No, I answered shortly, I do not. We might as well understand each other, Julie. I'm not in love with you, and I never was. It's been a pretty flirtation, nothing more. I'm going home tomorrow, and... But you will come again. Surely you will come again, she pleaded. 
You cannot mean it when you say you do not love me, Edward. Tell me that you spoke so, but to tease me. A warning hiss sounded in the grass beside my foot, but I was too angry to be frightened. Go ahead. Set your devilish snake on me, I taunted. Let it bite me. I'd as soon be dead as. The snake was quick, but truly quicker. In the split second required for the thing to drive at me, she leaped across the grass-grown aisle and pushed me back. So violent was the shove she gave me that I fell against the tomb, struck my head against a small projecting stone and stumbled to my knees. As I fought for footing on the slippery grass, I saw the deadly wedge-shaped head strike full against the girl's bare ankles and heard her gasp with pain. The snake recoiled and swung its head toward me. But Julie dropped down to her knees and spread her arms protectingly about me. No, no, Grand Tant, she screamed. Not this one. Let me. Her voice broke on a little gasp, and with a retching hiccup, she sank limply to the grass. I tried to rise, but my foot slipped on the grass, and I fell heavily against the tomb, crashing my brow against the shell-set cement wall. I saw Julie lying in a little huddled heap of white garment, the blackness of the sword, and shadowy but clearly visible, an agent wrinkled negress with turbaned head and cambric apron bending over her, nursing her head against her bosom and rocking back and forth grotesquely while she crooned a wordless threnody. Where had she come from? I wondered idly. Where had the snake gone? Why did the moonlight seem to fade and flicker like a dying lamp? Once more I tried to rise, but slipped back to the grass before the tomb as everything went black before me. The lavender light of early morning was streaming over the tomb walls of the cemetery when I waked. As my eyes came level with the slab that sealed the crypt, I felt the breath catch in my throat. The crypt, like all its fellows, looked for all the world like an old oven let into a brick wall overlaid with peeling plaster. The ceiling stone was probably once white, but years had stained it to a dirty gray, and time had all but rubbed its legend out. Still, I could see the faint inscription carved in quaint old-fashioned letters, and disbelief gave way to incredulity, which was replaced by panic terror as I read. In French, Here lies Julie Amélie Marie Dayenne, a national from Paris, France. Born August 29, 1788. Deceased the 2nd of July, 1807. Julie? Little Julie, whom I'd held in my arms, whose mouth had lain on mine in eager kisses, was a corpse? Dead in her grave? More than a century? The silence lengthened. Ned stared miserably before him his outward eyes unseeing, but his mind's eye turned upon the scene in old St. Denis Cemetery. The grandan tugged and tugged again at the ends of his mustache, till I thought he dragged the hairs out by the roots. I could think of nothing which might ease the tension till. Of course, the name cut on the tombstone was a piece of pure coincidence, I hazarded. Most likely, the young woman deliberately assumed it to mislead you. And the snake which threatened our young friend? He was an assumption also, when in furs the grandan interrupted. No, but it could have been a trick. Ned saw an aged negress in the cemetery. And those old southern women have very strange powers. I damn think that you hit the thumb upon the nail that time, my friend, the little Frenchman nodded. Though, do you not realize how accurate your diagnosis is? To Ned. Have you seen this snake again since coming north? Yes, Ned replied, I have. I was too stunned to speak when I read the epitaph, and I wandered back to the hotel in a sort of daze and packed my bags in silence. Possibly that's why there was no further visitation there. I don't know. I do know nothing further happened, though, and when several months had passed with nothing but my memories to remind me of the incident, 
I began to think I'd suffer from some sort of walking nightmare. Nella and I went ahead with preparations for a wedding, but three weeks ago the postman brought me this. He reached into an inner pocket and drew out an envelope. It was of soft gray paper edged with silver gilt, and the address was in tiny, almost unreadable script. Monsieur Edward Minton, 30 Rue Carter, Harrisonville, New Jersey. Mm, the Grand Dan commented as he inspected. It is addressed à la Française. And the letter, may one read it? Of course, Ned answered. I'd like you to. Across the Grand Dan's shoulder, I made out the hastily scrawled missive. Remember your promise and the kiss of blood that sealed it. Soon I shall, tall, and you must come. Pour le temps et pour dénité. Julie. You recognize the writing, the Grand Dan asked. It is? Oh, yes, Ned answered bitterly. I recognize it. It's the same the other note was written in. And then? The boy smiled bleakly. I crushed the thing into a ball and threw it on the floor and stamped on it. Swore I'd die before I'd keep another rendezvous with her and... He broke off and put trembling hands up to his face. The so mysterious serpent came again, one may assume the Grand Dan prompted. But it's only a phantom snake, I interjected. At words, it's nothing more than a terrifying vision. Think so, Ned broke in. Do you remember Rowdy, my Airedale Terrier? I nodded. He was in the room when I opened this letter, and when that cotton mouth appeared beside me on the floor, he made a dash for it. Whether it would have struck me, I don't know, but it struck at him as he leaped and caught him squarely in the throat. He thrashed and fought, and the thing held on with locked jaws till I grabbed a fire shovel and made for it. Then before I could strike, it vanished. But its venom didn't. Poor old Rowdy was dead before I could get him out of the house. But I took his corpse to Dr. Kershaw, the veterinary, and told him Rowdy died suddenly and I wanted him to make an autopsy. He went back to his operating room and stayed there half an hour. When he came back to the office, he was wiping his glasses and wore the most astonished look I've ever seen on a human face. You say your dog died suddenly? In the house, he asked. Yes, I told him. Just rolled over and died. Well, bless my soul. That's the most amazing thing I've ever heard, he answered. I can't account for it. That dog died from snake bite. Copperhead, I'd say. And the marks of the fangs show plainly on his throat. But I thought you said it was a water moccasin, I objected. Now Dr. Kershaw says it was a copperhead. Ah, bah, the Grand Dan laughed, a thought unpleasantly. Did no one ever tell you that the Copperhead and Moccasin are of close kin, my friend? Have not you heard? Some ophiologists maintain the Moccasin is but a dark variety of Copperhead. He did not pause for my reply, but turned again to Ned. One understands your chivalry, Monsieur. For yourself, you have no fear, since after all, at times, life can be bought too dearly. But the death of your small dog has put a different aspect on the matter. If this never to be sufficiently anathemized serpent, which comes and goes like the bolt of surprise, the, how do you call him, Jack from the Box, is enough a ghost thing to appear at any time and place it wills, but sufficiently physical to exude venom, which will kill a strong and healthy terrier, you have the fear for Mademoiselle Nella, n'est-ce pas? Precisely you. And you are well advised to have the caution, my young friend. We face a serious condition. What do you advise? The Frenchman teased his needlepoint mustache tip with a thoughtful thumb and forefinger. For the present, nothing, he replied at length. Let me look the situation over. Let me view it from all angles. Whatever I might tell you now would probably be wrong. Suppose we meet again one week from now. By that time, I should have my data well in hand. And in the meantime, continue to be coy with Mademoiselle Nella. Perhaps it would be well if you recalled important business which requires that you leave town till you hear from me again. There is no need to put her life in peril at this time. If it weren't for Kirchhoff's testimony, I'd say Ned Minton had gone raving crazy, I declared, as the door closed on our visitors. 
The whole thing's wilder than an opium smoker's dream. That meeting with the girl in New Orleans, the snake that comes and disappears, the assignation in the cemetery, it's all too preposterous. But I know Kershaw. He's as unimaginative as a side of soul leather, and as efficient as he is unimaginative. If he says Minton's dogs died of snake bite, that's what it died of. But the whole affair is so utterly fantastic. Agreed, de Grandin nodded. But what is fantasy but the appearance of mental images as such, severed from ordinary relations? The ordinary relations of images are those to which we are accustomed, which conform to our experience. The wider that experience, the more ordinary. We will find extraordinary relations. By example, take yourself. You sit in a dark auditorium and see a railway train come rushing at you. Now, it is not at all an ordinary experience for a locomotive to come dashing in a theater filled with people. It is quite otherwise. But you keep your seat. You do not flinch. You are not frightened. It is nothing but a motion picture which you understand. But if you were a savage from New Guinea, you would rise and fly in panic from this steaming, shrieking iron monster which bears down on you. Tiens, it is a matter of experience, you see. To you, it is an everyday event. To the savage, it would be a new and terrifying thing. Or perhaps you are at the hospital. You place a patient between you and the crook's tub of an x-ray. You turn on the current, you observe him through the fluorescent, and poof! His flesh all melts away and his bones spring out in sharp relief. Three hundred years ago, you would have howled like a stone dog at the sight and prayed to be delivered from the witchcraft which produced it. Today you curse and swear like twenty drunken privates if the road genealogist is but thirty seconds late in setting up the apparatus. These things are scientific. You understand their underlying formula. Therefore they seem natural. But mention what you please to call the occult, and you scoff, and that is but admitting that you are opposed to something which you do not understand. The credible and believable, that to which we are accustomed, the fantastic and incredible, is what we cannot explain in terms of previous experience. Voilà, c'est très simple, n'est pas? You mean to say you understand all this? Not at all, by any means. I'm clever, me, but not that clever. No, my friend, I am as much in the dark as you, only I do not refuse to credit what our young friend tells us. I believe the things he has related happened exactly as he has recounted them. I do not understand, but I believe. Accordingly, I must probe, I must sift, I must examine this matter. We see it now as a group of unrelated and irrelevant occurrences. But somewhere lies the key which will enable us to make harmony from this discord, to gather these stray tangled threads into an ordered pattern. I go to seek that key. Where? To New Orleans, of course. Tonight I pack my portmanteau. Tomorrow I entrain. Just now, he smothered tremendous yawn, now I do what every wise man does as often as he can. I take a drink. Seven evenings later we gathered in my study, the Grandin, Ned, and I, for the little Frenchman's shining eyes I knew his quest had been productive of results. My friends, he told us humbly, I am a clever person, and a lucky one as well. The morning after my arrival at New Orleans I enjoyed three Ramos visits then went to sit in City Park by the old dueling oak and wished with all my heart that I had taken four. And while I sat in self-reproachful thought, sorrowing for the drink that I had missed, behold, one passed by whom I recognized. He was my old schoolfellow, Paul Dubois, now a priest in holy orders and attached to the Cathedral of St. Louis. He took me to his quarters, that good, pious man, and gave me luncheon. It was Friday and a fast day, so we fasted. Mon Dieu, but we did fast on Creole gumbo and oysters a la Rockefeller and baked pompano and little shrimp fried crisp and olive oil and chicory salad and seven different kinds of cheese and wine. When we were so filled with fasting that we could not eat another morsel, 
my old friend took me to another priest, a native of New Orleans, whose stock of local lore was second only to his marvelous capacity for fine champagne. Morbleu, how I admire that one. And now attend me very carefully, my friends. What he disclosed to me makes many hidden mysteries all clear. In New Orleans there lived a wealthy family named Dayen. They possessed much gold and land, a thousand slaves or more, and one fair daughter by the name of Julie. When this country bought the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon and your army came to occupy the forts, this young girl fell in love with a young officer, a Lieutenant Philip Merriwell. Tenez, army love in those times was no different than it is today, it seems. This gay young lieutenant, he came, he wooed, he won, he rode away, and little Julie wept and sighed and finally died of heartbreak. In her lovesick illness, she had for constant company a slave, an old mulatress known to most as Maman Dragon, but to Julie simply as Grand Tant, Great Aunt. She had nursed our little Julie at the breast, and all her life she fostered and attended her. To her little white Mamselle she was all gentleness and kindness, but to others she was fierce and frightful, for she was a Kanjan woman, adept at Obea, the black magic of the Congo, and among the blacks she ruled as queen by force of fear, while the whites were wont to treat her with respect, and it was more than merely whispered, retain her services upon occasion. She could spell protection to the duelist, and he who bore her charm would surely conquer on the field of honor. She brewed love drafts, which turned the hearts and heads of the most capricious coquettes, or the most constant wives as occasion warranted. By merely staring fixedly at someone, she could cause him to take sick and die, and here we commence to tread upon our own terrain. She was said to have the power of changing to a snake at will. Very good, you follow? When poor young Julie died of heartbreak, it was old Maman Dragon, the little white one grand tante, who watched beside her bed. It is said she stood beside her mistress' coffin and called the curse upon the fickle lover, swore he would come back and die beside the body of the sweetheart he deserted. She also made a prophecy. Julie should have many loves, but her body should not know corruption nor her spirit rest until she could find one to keep his promise and return to her with words of love upon his lips. Those who failed her should die horribly, but he who kept his pledge would bring her rest and peace. This augury she made while she stood beside her mistress' coffin just before they sealed it in the tomb in old St. Denis Cemetery. Then she disappeared. You mean she ran away, I asked? I mean she disappeared, vanished, evanced, evaporated. She was never seen again, not even by the people who stood next to her when she pronounced her prophecy. But, no buts, my friend, if you will be so kind. Years later, when the British stormed New Orleans, Lieutenant Merriweather was there with General Andrew Jackson. He survived the battle like a man whose life is charmed, though all around him comrades fell and three horses were shot under him. Then, when the strife was done, he went to the grand banquet tendered to the victors, while gaiety was at its height, he abruptly left the table. Next morning he was found upon the grass before the tomb of Julie Dayen. He was dead. He died from snake bite. The years marched on, and stories spread about the town. Stories of a strange and lovely belle dame sans merci, a modern Circe who lured young gallants to their doom. Time and again, some gay young blade of New Orleans would boast a conquest. Passing late at night through Royal Street, he would have a flower dropped to him as he walked underneath the balcony. He would meet a lovely girl dressed in the early Empress style and be surprised at the ease with which he pushed his suit. Then, upon the trees in Chartres Street, appeared his funeral notice. He was dead, 
Invariably he was dead of snake bite. Parbleu. It got to be a saying that he who died mysteriously must have met the Lady of the Moonlight as he walked through Royal Street. He paused and poured a thimble full of brandy in his coffee. You see, he asked. No, I'm shot if I do, I answered. I can't see the connection between night and breaking dawn, perhaps, he asked sarcastically. If two and two make four, my friend, and even you will not deny they do, then these things I have told you give an explanation of our young friend's trouble. The girl he met was most indubitably Julie, poor little Julie Diane, on whose tombstone it is carved ici repose marchement. Here lies unhappily the so mysterious snake which menaces young Monsieur Minton is none other than the aged Maman Dragon, Grand Tante, as Julie called her. But Ned's already failed to keep his tryst, I objected. Why didn't this snake woman sting him in the hotel or... Do you recall what Julie said when first the snake appeared? He interrupted. Not this one, Grand Tante. And again, in the old cemetery, when the serpent actually struck at him, she threw herself before him and received the blow. It could not permanently injure her, to earthly injuries the dead are proof, but the shock of it caused her to swoon. It seems, Monsieur, he bowed to Ned, you are more fortunate than any of those others. Several times you have been close to death, but each time you escaped. You have been given chance and chance again to keep your pledged word to the dead a thing no other faithless lover of the little Julie ever had. It seems, monsieur, this dead girl truly loves you. How horrible, I muttered. You said it, Dr. Trowbridge, Ned seconded. It looks as if I'm in a spot all right. Manon, the Grand Don contradicted. Escape is obvious, my friend. How in heaven's name? Keep your promised word. Go back to her. Good Lord! I can't do that. Go back to a corpse? Take her in my arms? Kiss her? Sentiment. Why not? Why? Why? She's dead. Is she not beautiful? She's lovely and alluring as a siren song. I think she's the most exquisite thing I've ever seen, but... He rose and walked unsteadily across the room. If it weren't for Nella, he said slowly, I might not find it hard to follow your advice. Julie is sweet and beautiful and artless and affectionate as a child, kind too, the way she stood between me and that awful snake thing, but, oh, it's out of the question. Then we must expand the question to accommodate it, my friend, for the safety of the living, for Mademoiselle Nella's sake, and for the repose of the dead. You must keep the oath you swore to little Julie Diane. You must go back to New Orleans and keep your rendezvous. The dead of old Saint Denis lay in dreamless sleep beneath the palely argent rays of the fast waxing moon. The oven like tombs were gay with hardly wilted flowers, for two days before was All Saints' Day, and no grave in all New Orleans is so lowly, no dead so long interred, that pious hands do not bear blossoms of remembrance to them on that feast of memories. The Grand Dan, had been busily engaged all afternoon making mysterious trips to the old Negro quarter in company with a patriarchal scion of Indian and Negro ancestry who professed ability to guide him to the city's foremost practitioner of voodoo, returning to the hotel only to dash out again to consult his friend at the cathedral, coming back to stare with thoughtful eyes upon the changing panorama of Canal Street while Ned, nervous as a racehorse at the barrier, tramped up and down the room, lighting cigarette from cigarette and drinking absinthe fraps, alternating with sharp, bitter Sazerac cocktails, till I wondered that he did not fall in utter alcoholic collapse. By evening, I had that eerie feeling that the same experience when alone with mad folk. I was ready to shriek at any unexpected noise or turn and run at sight of a strange shadow. My friend, the grandan ordered as we reached the grass-paved corridor of tombs where Ned had told us that the Ayen vaults were. I suggest that you drink this. From an inner pocket, he drew out 
a tiny flask of ruby glass and snapped its stopper loose. A strong and slightly acrid scent came to me, sweet and spicy, faintly reminiscent of the odor of the aromatic herbs one smells about a mummy's wrappings. Thanks. I've had enough to drink already, Ned said shortly. You are informing me, mon vieux, the little Frenchman answered with a smile. It is for that I brought this draft along. It will help you draw yourself together. You have need of all your faculties this time, believe me. Ned put the bottle to his lips, drained its contents, hiccups lightly, then braced his shoulders. This is a pickup, he complimented. Too bad you didn't let me have it sooner, sir. I think I can go through the ordeal now. One is sure you can, the Frenchman answered confidently. Walk slowly toward the spot where you last saw Julie, if you please. We shall await you here, an easy call, if we are needed. The Isle of Tombs was empty as Ned left us. The turf had been fresh mown for the day of visitation and was as smooth and short as a lawn tennis court. A field mouse could not have run across the pathway without our seeing it. This much I noticed idly as Ned trudged away from us, walking more like a man on his way to the gallows than one who went to keep a lover's rendezvous. And suddenly he was not alone. There was another with him, a girl dressed in a clinging robe of sheer white muslin, cut in the charming fashion of the First Empire, girdled high beneath the bosom with a sash of light blue ribbon. A wreath of pale gardenias lay upon her bright fair hair. Her slender arms were pearl white in the moonlight. As she stepped toward Ned, I thought, involuntarily, of a line from Sir John Suckling. Her feet, like little mice, stole in and out. Edouard, chérie, au courrier de mon coeur, se vêtement toi, ta has come willingly, an ass petit amant. I'm here, Ned answered steadily, but only he paused and drew a sudden gasping breath as though a hand had been laid on his throat. Sherry, the girl asked in a trembling voice, you are cold to me. Do not you love me then? You are not here because your heart heard my heart calling, O oh, heart of my heart's heart. If you knew how I've longed and waited to it has been triste, mon Edouard, lying in my narrow bed alone while winter rains and summer suns beat down, listening for your footfall. I could have gone out at my pleasure whenever moonlight made the nights all bright with silver. I could have sought for other lovers, but I would not. You held release for me within your hands, and if I might not have it from you, I would forfeit it forever. Do not you bring release for me, my Edward. Say that it is so. An odd look came into the boy's face. He might have seen her for the first time and then dazzled by her beauty and the winsome sweetness of her voice. Julie, he whispered softly, poor, patient, faithful little Julie. In a single stride, he crossed the intervening turf and was on his knees before her, kissing her hands, the hem of her gown, her sandaled feet and babbling half-coherent broken words of love. She put her hands upon his head as if in benediction, then turned them holding them palm forward to his lips, finally crooked her fingers underneath his chin and raised his face. Nay, love, sweet love, art thou a worshipper, and I a saint that thou should kneel to me? She asked him tenderly, See, my lips are famishing for thine. And wilt thou waste thy kisses on my hands and feet and garment? Make haste, my heart. We have but little time, and I would know the kisses of redemption, er. They clung together in the moonlight. Her white robe, lissom form, and its somberly clad body seemed to melt and merge in one, while her hands reached up to clasp his cheek and draw his face down to her yearning scarlet mouth. The grand dame was reciting something in a mumbling monotone. His words were scarcely audible, but I caught a phrase occasionally. Rest eternal grant to her, O Lord, let light eternal shine upon her. From the gates of hell her soul delivered. Kiri lays on. Julie, we heard Ned's despairing, and, ha, it comes, it has begun. It finishes, the grand whispered gratingly. 
the girl had sunk down to the grass as though she swooned one arm had fallen limply from ned's shoulder but the other still was clasped about his neck as we raced toward them adieu mon amoureux adieu pour ce monde adieu pour le autre adieu pour l'éternité we heard her sob when we reached him ned knelt empty-armed before the tomb of julie there was neither sign nor trace so a system if you will my friend the grand dan bade motioning me to take ned's elbow help him to the gate i follow quickly but first i have a task to do as i led ned staggering like a drunken man toward the cemetery exit i heard the clang of metal striking metal at the tomb behind us what did you stop behind to do i asked as we prepared to bed at the hotel he flashed his quick infectious smile at me and tweaked his mustache ends for all the world like a self-satisfied tomcat furbishing his whiskers after finishing a bowl of cream there was an alteration to that epitaph i had to make you recall it read here lies unhappily julie dayen that is no longer true i chiseled off the unhappy part thanks to monsieur edward's courage and my cleverness the old one's prophecy was fulfilled tonight and poor small julie has found rest at last tomorrow morning they celebrate the first of a series of masses i have arranged for her at the, the cathedral what was that drink you gave ned just before he left us i asked curiously it smelled like le bon dieu and the devil no not i he answered with a grin it was a voodoo love potion i found the realization that she had been dead a century and more so greatly troubled our young friend that he swore he could not be affectionate to our poor julie so i went down to the french quarter in the afternoon and arranged to have a filter brewed at bien the aged black one who concocted it assured me that she could inspire love for the image of a crocodile in the heart of any one who looked upon it after taking but a drop of her decoction and she charged me 20 dollars for it but i think i had my money's worth did it not work miraculously then julie's really gone ned's coming back released her from the spell not wholly gone he corrected her little body now is but a small handful of dust her spirit is no longer earthbound and the familiar demon who in life was old maman dragon has left the earth with her as well no longer will she metamorphosize into a snake and kill the faithless ones who kiss her little mistress and then forswear their troth but no my friend julie is not gone entirely i think in the years to come when ned and nella have long been joined in wedded bliss there will be minutes when julie's face and julie's voice and the touch of julie's little hands will haunt his memory there will always be one little corner of his heart which never will belong to madame nella minton for it will be forever julie's yes i think that it is so slowly deliberately almost ritualistically he poured a glass of wine and raised it to you my poor little one he said softly as he looked across the sleeping city toward old saint denis cemetery you quit earth with a kiss upon your lips may you sleep serene in paradise until another kiss shall waken you